Our next speaker is a man who needs no introduction, but I'll give him one anyway. He is one of the longest lived voices in Catholic radio. Uh, yes, he broadcasts with Father Coughlin. Um, no, not, not quite. <laughs> not, <laughs> not quite that long, but no, seriously, my church is very well known in the, uh, in the area of Catholic broadcasting. As you know, he works with our own brother Andre's uh, Reconquest Radio, which is a sort of a subsidiary of his, uh, how do I put it, Radio Empire. <laughs> Again, you got paid. <laughs> That's so why I get the big bucks for spinning the yarns. Uh, no, but seriously, ladies and gentlemen, uh, he's, he's done a great deal of, of tremendous work for the growth of the faith in this country. And I'm actually sincere, it does happen, when um, I'm very sincere in saying, let's give him a great round of applause and a welcome to St. Benedict Center. Mike Church. You forgot your note. And it's free of charge. <laughs> From us to you. It's his lunch note. <laughs> well, good, uh, good morning. Good morning. So there's a lot of, uh, it's not that there's a little pressure on me or anything. I had at least a half a dozen of you come up to me sometime before this talk today or yesterday and say, are you that church guy? <laughs> yeah, that's me. You going to give a talk tomorrow? Yes, ma'am. Well, I've never listened to you before. And I don't, I don't know what to expect, so I've got high expectations. I'm like, did anyone else get the high expectation speech other than me? <laughs> and I have to tell you, uh, thanks to brother, thanks to Charles, thanks to the generosity and kindness shown by so many of you that I have not earned and humbly accept. Um, uh, thanks to sister, all the sisters, sister Philomena, and her sister, and her father, and all of you that I have been so blessed to meet and making me feel at home, because I tell you, Charles didn't say this, but I've never spoken in front of an ecclesiastical audience. I've done dozens and dozens and dozens of talks, and I'm probably more nervous for this one because I don't want to blow it. <laughs> <laughs> so like I said, uh, if you came here and you paid to see me and you're disappointed, I'm happy to announce that after the talk, Charles has gratefully accepted that he will personally refund all of your monies, <laughs> including travel expenses. So keep your... <laughs> so I wanted to start off with a joke, and I had a few in mind, but in a conference where so many great speakers have had, told so many great jokes, the task becomes a little bit more challenging, shall we say. <laughs> now, in considering that, I toyed with up yours, Muhammad. <laughs> then, up yours, Luther. And finally settled on the fact that I'm ecstatic that I do not have to follow Crooked Hillary. <laughs> Speaking of Crooked Hillary, I read the other day that Mrs. Clinton was a devout Methodist. <laughs> Whatever that is. <laughs> this is quite a shock, I must say. And uh, I did not know that Methodists were a... Sodomite coddlers, B, baby aborters, C, pathological liars. <laughs> if only Friar Luther could see his work in action today. How proud he would, of a father he would be. We might ask the question of whether Luther or his English counterparts would vote for Mrs. Clinton, and we could thus begin to talk about the counter-reformation that we're all here to talk about, with the observation that it is because of Luther and Henry VIII, that this ugliest form of government, as Ronald Reagan would call it, known as democracy, has been unleashed upon the Christian world. Now, for a hysterical view of this, recall the scene from Monty Python's Search for the Holy Grail movie, where King Arthur is confronted by a peasant who denies the king's authority because he didn't vote for him. If you've seen the movie, you know, why'd you become king then? I didn't vote for you. You don't become king by voting. Well, how'd you become king then? The lady of the lake, her arm clad in the pure shimmering sunlight, came from the water and held Excalibur law, saying that I, Arthur, was to be king. That is why I'm your king. Now, you may think that that's kind of farcical, but would, would, would we really be worse off if a strange woman lying in a pond 
had lobbed a scimitar at a man and made him king of the United States? The answer is yes, so long as the king was not Bill Clinton and the pawn woman wasn't Hillary. The entertainment portion of the talk now concluded. We can proceed to actual business. The title of my talk, in keeping with the theme of the conference, is The Great Faith Robbery, the English Deformation. And yesterday, Sister Philomena talked about the difference between reform and she actually said deform, deformation. And that is precisely what the English Reformation should be called because it was a deformation. If you haven't seen it, I'll tell you a little bit about the basis for the, some of the talk. The Great Train Robbery, tro, uh, train robbery was written by the great late Dr. Michael Crichton and set in England in uh, the 1860s. And as we shall see, this film could not and the novel could not have happened legally and morally in anything but a Protestant England, which is to say it could not have happened even as a work of fiction, save for it being a cautionary tale in a Catholic England, for example, this, the characters wouldn't have made any sense. The robbery wouldn't have made any sense. The things that they did in public, they would not have been allowed to do. And if they did, they would have been called heretics. And if we follow the English form of what they do with heretics, I'll tell you about that later in the talk. Hold that thought. If you ha how many of you have seen the movie, The Great Train Robbery? What? One? <laughs> it's going to be a long day, brother. <laughs> <laughs> I discovered this last night. Oh, but you got the Monty Python joke. By the way, how many of you are Monty Python fans? I, I put my hands down. Have you ever thought about the title? What does Monty mean in, e in e English Scottish? Naked. <laughs> what is a python? A s I don't yet. Sister. <laughs> I don't need to go any further, but add naked snake flying circus. And I think that you get the picture of just now, again, does Monty Python flying circus happen in Catholic England to the point as uh, of it being as popular as it is today? I say the answer is no. Is there room for beauty and humor in the church? Somebody said last night they had uh, read uh, or had uh, heard a talk by Father Michael Mary, uh, of the Alpine Redemptorist. And Father Mary um, uh, gave a talk that I'm very fond of about the Towers of Sion. If you haven't heard it, look it up on YouTube and listen to it. It's magnificent. And in his talk, he begins his talk you know, looking at all the dour faces. And I love to quote St. Catherine of Siena to say, No dour saints. We are Catholics. We're not Baptists. <laughs> You're allowed to drink and smoke cigars and be happy and enjoy life because God created all this wonderful stuff for us to consume moderately and modestly. So with that, let me tell you a little bit about the movie. In the movie version of the book, which Dr. Crichton wrote in 1975, they turned it into a movie in 1978, which if you know anything about the movie making process, that is just lightning speed. It doesn't happen that fast. It takes a long time to get a book to become a movie unless you're Unless you got some serious connections, and Dr. Crichton was just um, just one of the best at this. Um, the film starred Sean Connery, Leslie Ann Down, and Donald Sutherland. Here's the plot. Four keys must be temporarily stolen so copies can be made of the keys. These keys will then open a pair of twin safes. Duh, Mike, pair. Twin safes uh, on, on a train, a moving train that contains bars of bullion gold that is a payroll bound for Crimea that's paying for a war the English are involved in in France. Now, think about it. If you know where Crimea is and you know where England is, then try and figure out how a train gets from Suffolk Station to Crimea. There's the matter of a channel, which had no passage over it. <laughs> that is a matter of navigating the Alps and everything. Anyways, Dr. Crichton, maybe he gets into that in the book. I didn't read it. So this is what's going, this is what's going to, to, they're going to rob this train. Now, Dante would be proud of the vices that were employed to steal the keys. Here we go. Pride, lust, greed, justice or injustice, and then lust again for good measure. And then we'll throw in a little sloth. And as we shall see, the same vices will be employed during the great faith robbery that happened in England. Only the consequences will not cost a few dozen bars of gold, 
but rather, sadly, a few hundred million souls. And that's the fact, ladies and gentlemen, and that's why we're here today to keep the counter-reformation going. And um, if you missed it yesterday, part of the counter-reformation, I think, in Sister Philomena, and uh, how many of you figured out Hawaiian reform before she got to Hawaiian reform? So you remember the, the graph of, of how you get the age of zeal? I, I think that we're in the, that all of us, by virtue of the size of the, of the crowd here and how many people are in this room, that we, we are on the, uh, the bell. We're on the, uh, on the way up to the top of the bell. And if you're familiar with the bell curve, we've got a little way to go, but there is a zeal that is building out there, and that's a good thing. So back to what I'm supposed to be talking about. To give the ending away, nothing about religious worship in England was reformed during the detestable epoch but it, was mo uh, but it most certainly and remains deformed. The English deformation was a top-down coup de grace. That's what it was, final stroke. By the time the House of Tudor is done, there is no legal Catholicism in England. Now, that may not be shocking to you, and it's certainly not shocking to people that live in England today. But if you were around at the turn of the 16th century, it would be the most unprecedented, unexpected event in the history of the Roman Catholic Church. No one could have foreseen in 1521 or 22, before Henry went nuts, no one could have foreseen that by the time his bastard child daughter, Elizabeth, had gotten to the throne and the supremacy laws were passed, that England would have outlawed Catholicism. Now, that's only one, maybe one and a half generation. That is an event that is impossible to happen, save for A, a revolution, which would be from the ground up, and B, a coup de grace that comes from the top down. In other words, it's imposed. Think of the Cristeros in Mexico, for example, and what happened to them, and we'll get to that in a minute. So the English Deformation was a top-down coup de grace executed with illegitimate, lethal royal power by the House of Tudor, against the then Catholic English people. So in preparing for this talk, I uh, uh, spent an entire day trying to find out whether Dr. Michael Crichton had any religious affiliation, and like any successful famous person who humbly keeps to themselves, and he did, all the usual suspects claim him as their own. You got your Scientologists say he was one of them, you got your deists, you got your, uh, your flat earth people, you name it, they say, oh, Crichton was one of us. Maybe even the Methodists claimed him. But I could find no direct link between M Michael Crichton and a religion, save for analyzing his work, which could be easily identified as Catholic. And if you've read Dr. Crichton, I'm not saying that he was or that he was a Catholic author, he certainly wasn't, but his work is themed, and I'll explain. For our talk today, um, that shouldn't matter, but the, the explanation is this. There are subtle things in Crichton's work, and you probably, a lot of you are familiar with him. Okay, so I struck out with Monty Python, but how many of you have seen Jurassic Park? See, everybody. Humor, dinosaurs, I don't know. What's the theme in Jurassic Park? Don't mess with God's work. That's the theme. Creation actually happened, and you guys are not, you're not good at it. There's a line in the, in the, in the film where, where uh, Jeff Goldblum says, and I, I'll try to remember it because I didn't write it down. God creates man. God creates dinosaur. God kills dinosaur. Man creates dinosaur. Dinosaur eats man. And then Laura Dern says, woman inherits the earth. <laughs> so, and we're all familiar with the work. It, it's a good film. And Spielberg did a great job. But think of the, of the moral implications that are going on in Jurassic Park. And that's what led me to, um, to do a little bit of research about uh, Dr. Crichton. How many of you have seen or read the book that he also wrote called Congo? Because this is about, what's it about, Charles? It's about the pursuit of King Solomon's mind. There's this, Crichton fantasizes fictionally that King Solomon's minds actually do exist. And they go on, a, and this group of, of Indiana Jones types goes on this quest to find them. Now, even though they do eventually find what they think is the mine and the gold, hardly anyone leaves out of there with any of the gold. And, and that's because they succumbed to pride, 
envy, and sloth. I, you know, I, we're at the St. Benedict Center, so I, I, I can throw this in for just a moment. Brother Francis uh, tells a, a story in one of his, uh, his talks on ethics, I think, where he quotes Father Feeney about, no crime could ever be committed without four cardinal, four cardinal virtues. You will have to have justice, you will have to have temperance, you will have to have, brother help me out, what are the other two? <laughs> For fortitude and prudence. And he explains about, you know, the thieves would have to agree to divvy the money up. They'd have to have the prudence to plan and not get drunk the day of the crime. So you think about this. This is all going on in the movie Congo, too. And the vices ultimately get the, get the better of the bad guys. So just to set up a little bit about the great train robbery that I, I, I'm not sure. I can't say for certain because I didn't know uh, Dr. Crichton. But I think that he was making a, a moral point in, in, in many of these novels and these books. And we can take that because and, and we talk about this a lot on our radio show uh, or our radio shows. And that is if we're not part of the mainstream, if what we do is not reflected in the mainstream, then we got to make our own mainstream. And if you make it, this is a mainstream here. This little community here has its own mainstream. And brother gets to determine what the mainstream is. And if you, if you cross him, no. <laughs> Contrary to urban legend, though, it wasn't always a fact for a majority of England's existence. Because for a majority of her existence, she was actually a Catholic country. And in some ways, England was even more Catholic than Rome herself. As a brief telling of the early uh, Catholic history of England will show, from nearly the time of the apostles being dispatched to convert the pagan world, England responded in the affirmative and with great reverence and grace. Those who are familiar with my republishing, uh, Father Gaetano de Bergamo's Humility of Heart, it's a great book, and I've got a couple back there if you want to pick one up on the way out today. Um, <clears throat> will be familiar with the translator. This book was written in Italian. It was translated in 19, from 1894 to 1903 by Herbert Cardinal Vaughan. Uh, and I'll, I'll tell you why that's important. It is a work by Abbot Gasque. Am I saying that right, brother? Gasque. Gasque. that bears Vaughan's 1903 imprimatur that we would find a moving account of early England's history. The history would come as a shock to Brighton's who fancy themselves fashionable defenders of the indefensible Darwin heresy and thus descended from uncivilized primates. Today's churchmen accepted they actually are descended from quite holy prelates. Today we think, somebody got that, thank you. <laughs> I'm here all week. Today we think of England as either the hive from which well-spoken tea-sipping snobs are bred or as the land where public print media features, softcore pornography, and film media details hardcore heresies with great joy. Turn on any English media and watch your eyes. <laughs> you need to practice serious custody of the eyes. Uh, but it wasn't always so. Now let me explain my personal experience and how I can re relate to this. And I know Charles has visited. Anyone visited the United Kingdom? You'll be able to share this, and I bet you'll say, that's exactly right. I never thought about it. Here's what I, here's, here's what I did see in Scotland in my two trips, and I spent a total of about three weeks there. Beautiful. It's just breathtakingly beautiful. The Scottish people are warm. They're friendly. They, uh, surprisingly, they don't hate Yanks. You would think that they would, but they don't. Um, they, um, their food is not bland, as, as you hear, oh, the food in Scotland is terrible. No, it's not. What did you eat? I think you must have had some Polish cooking <laughs> while in Scotland. <laughs> the rolling hillsides are just, it's beautiful. It's breathtaking. I found the people warm. I still have friends. As a matter of fact, I have a friend that's coming from Scotland to visit my wife and I and my, and my daughter and I. Who, we, we went to Scotland together uh, for his second year in a row to come to, to New Orleans for the Mardi Gras. So these are, these are good people, um, uh, and it's just, it breaks your heart when you know that they have just been robbed, and I'm going to use that terminology throughout the day, they were robbed of their faith to the point where it doesn't exist there anymore. It's not there. Here's some proof. You visited there. You, all of you can, can back this up. If you went into any houses, I stayed in six bed and breakfasts in two hotels, That's eight. 
I never saw one crucifix, not one. Never saw one painting or picture of Our Lady, not one. I never saw one mimeograph, engraving, you name it, of a Roman Catholic saint, not one. I met a young lady who was a theology major at St. Andrews University. And by the way, Charles, by the time we get to the end of this little part, we should do a bit on John Stuart Mill. <laughs> How about that, brother? This young lady was getting her master's in theology at St. Andrews. So I naturally stuck. I must be talking to a Catholic at the worst, an Anglican. No, I was talking to a earth-dwelling pagan. <laughs> Even though she could quote St. Augustine, she would go, but nobody believes that anymore. Even though she could quote St. Thomas Aquinas and she knew the history of the church in England, she didn't believe any of it. The girl had absolutely 0.0, .0 faith, none. Now that is a master. She's pursuing a master's, not pursuing, she got it. They graduated a theology major who had no faith. I pity these souls, and I pity them with great love and charity, I hope. More evidence. It's almost impossible to find a Roman Catholic church. I got to Scotland thinking like, Scotland, I'm Catholics. They love Catholics. <laughs> I'm going through the phone book going, I'm in St. Andrews for heaven's sake. They have to have a church. Uh, no, there isn't. In the, in the town where it is believed that the relics of the beloved apostle, St. Andrew, are act were actually housed once upon a time, squirreled away to be kept away from thieves, and it's hidden on the English island in North England and in Scotland, right there on the coast of the Fife of Firth, they call it. That church today still exists. It was built around the 9th century, and it's a ruin. There's no, you, you can go tour it. It's absolutely breathtaking in the size. It's, it, I can't describe it other than to say, if you've been to St. Patrick's in New York, New York City, right if you're, <laughs> get a rope <laughs> if you've been to st patrick's in new york city it is almost as large and imagine this they built this i think in the ninth century um this thing is and you can see the size of the stones they had to hoist up to build this thing that is the size of this cathedral that is in ruins it's basically it's just you go there and take pictures of it and you wonder like i wonder what this thing looked like back in the day on the guided trip that I took, first time we took a guided trip, we had a tour guides and we stayed with a tour group. Um, we arrived on Sunday and Sunday was treated like to, with the reverence of Tuesday. There was no allocation made. Well, you know, if some of you need to go to mass or something or some of you have a church obligation, no, no mention of it whatsoever. It didn't exist. So that's just a small personal experience of the people in England. If you were to stop and say your blessing at a meal in public, we all know it. If you were to stop and, and to do that, people around you would look at you as if your skin was tinted purple. Wait, it gets worse. Your head is square. All three of them. That's now this is uh, I, I'm joking about this, but it is truly sad and you're going to hear why English folklore holds that that's England today and Scotland is part of the United Kingdom still England English folklore holds that England was converted shortly after our Lord's death by St. Joseph of Arimathea. Some people believe that some people don't who allegedly brought the Holy Grail of Christ's Last Supper to the island. But I doubt that today's Christians could distinguish and think about this. St. Joseph of Arimathea. Do you think today's English uh, resident or English uh, uh, citizen of England or Scotland could distinguish St. Joseph of Arimathea from British actor Joseph Fiennes? <laughs> it is more likely that a, sto uh, that a uh, 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 but for the actual history, it's more likely that this is what happened. And this is a story that is relayed to us by St. Bede or Bed. Is it Bede? Bede. Bede. Lucius, king of Britain, sent to Pope Eleutherius in the year A.D. 157, praying to be made a Christian by an act of his authority, and how upon his position being granted, his messengers were instructed in the faith and baptized. Of them, Elphan, it is said, was consecrated a bishop, and another, Medwai, a doctor or teacher. 
the ancient devotion of the Welsh to this King Lucius and to his messengers, as well as to the two Italian missioners, Damianus and Fugatius, who are said to have been sent by the Pope at this time into England, which seem to testify in some measure to some substantial truth in this legend. I gave you the date. That's 157 A.D. Now, I want to argue about the, get into a, a, a pure historical discussion about what happened and what century and what year they came to England because there are those that say that, no, those weren't English, those were Romans that were there, etc., etc. It doesn't matter. It goes almost back to the time of Christ. We can say that. So we're going to be talking about the English Deformation, which takes place in the 16th century. I just quoted you from the second. By my count, that's 1,400 years. That is a millennia and 400 years. To put that in perspective, nine years ago, we recognized the 400-year anniversary, just to tell you how far back this goes, of the first Anglicans or whatever they were, Protestants arriving at Jamestown, Virginia. Put that in perspective, Jamestown to today plus a millennia. That's how long the English were Catholic. That's a long time, folks. You don't erase something like that from the ground up unless there's a really good reason, and there wasn't, or as we shall see, this is what actually happened. So back to the great train robbery and the great faith robbery. There are four keys that I'll fold out, uh, relay for you, uh, uh, spread out here for you today to try to understand what actually happened in England during the Deformation. So let's use a couple of uh, uh, virtues and vices. Lust, pride, justice, and through justice, we'll uh, relate a little private property theft. Lust, custody of the eyes. Gentlemen, do you practice custody of the eyes? Not you, Charles. <laughs> Most Catholic men practice custody of their eyes. Most Protestant men practice custody of their wives' eyes. <laughs> Put this in perspective. One cannot imagine the parishioners of the Bells of St. Mary's cheering the robbery of the Bailey Savings alone. <laughs> or Sister Mary Benedict being tempted by Sean Connery's charms so the keys to the school safe could be stolen. <laughs> Lust. Pride. In one scene, Sean Connery is asked why he wants to rob the train, and he responds, Why, my dear? Because it is there, and they say it can't be done. <laughs> Pride. Justice. Two kinds of justice, communicative and dis uh, distributive. The communicative deprives the train company of its gold, and the distributive deprives the public of justice after Sean Connery is convicted of, the, of robbing the train, but escapes to the approving whales of the Protestant gallery. Now, just think about this. The gold that is on the train is ultimately going to be used to pay English soldiers. Some French will get it too, and some Crimeans or whatever Prussian king had sent other soldiers. It's going to pay their own soldiers. But because they've lost the concept of the cardinal virtues and the vices, and they've lost the concept of sin, then they can cheer on because it's just the big bad train company that's been robbed. Even though who really is being robbed are the men that are ultimately going to receive the gold. Now, again, this doesn't happen in a Catholic England. It can only happen in a Protestant England. So the comparison here between the great faith robbery and the great train robbery, and, and that's how I'm making it here. Now, how did all this come about in what is now England, a totally secular country, as they call the United Kingdom? I mean, just the term United Kingdom is devoid of any majesty or any holiness that you could think of unless they were talking about the holy united kingdom think about that quite simply the sins of lust pride property and injustice committed by henry the eighth and his wicked bastard child bloody bess and yes she was a bastard because the pope refused to grant henry his divorce yesterday we heard that there's only one kind of marriage the sacramental kind henry got a sacramental kind with catherine of aragon you know how he got it Charles knows, many of you know, he had to appeal to the Pope because he was basically marrying his dead brother's wife, Catherine. So the, Pope, the irony of this is, is Henry had to appeal to the authority of the Pope in order to gain permission to marry Catherine. 
And now, when he's all hot and bothered for Anne Boleyn, he wants to undo it. And so he tries to concoct this scheme and puts his best men to the task, and they write a letter to the Pope. And I, I, I'm not going to get into all the details of this. I'm just going to give you the, the brief narrative. But in the end, the Pope says no. And this is when Henry says, okay, you're not Pope anymore. I am. And that's where this begins. In 13, and I'd like to also introduce you to the, uh, the book that I'm publishing. It's called The English Reformation, and the remainder of this talk will be dedicated to Father Gerard Culkin. Um, if you don't know, Father Culkin was uh, obviously a priest, and after his ordination, he was spotted uh, during his theological studies. His, um, his teachers, his professors, um, his superiors noticed that he, he had a penchant for history. He was really good at it. Excuse me. So good, in fact, that they set him to the task of writing any histories that that, that particular order uh, needed. And Father Culkin excelled at it. And while he was doing this, he was English, um, he started researching and then gathering information about the English Reformation. Because it had always, since he was a child, it had always upset him. Um, and in the book that I'm republishing, which you can, I'll tell you about it, uh, how you could get a copy of it later on if, if you're interested. Um, Father Culkin has, he lays his case out in 13 chapters. Now, there are books on the English Reformation that come in eight volumes. That's how much history is to be consumed. Father has condensed this, or he condensed, condensed it down in 1954 in a series of 13 newspaper articles for the Catholic Register, I believe, that each month they would publish a, 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 a new chapter, about 10 pages long. And as the story became more exciting and people started learning about, well, I never knew this history, there was demand, such demand for this, uh, for this magazine that they asked Father to, uh, to up, write faster, write more. And so ultimately, when he finishes his work, they put a, uh, he puts a book together, and it's published in 1954. It's then published in the second edition, and it's not published again in the second edition after 1962. And Father died in 1964. So, um, Father Gerard Call can play, uh, pray for us and pray for me that I don't get any of this wrong. Um, I'd like to read you the chapters, and this is how quick you can read this in an afternoon. And I hope people in Britain somehow will get a hold of this and that they'll read it, because you can read it in about four hours. Here's the chapter list. This is how brief and concise, 13 chapters, 100 and, uh, 118 pages. England before the Reformation, the King's Great Matter, the Reformation Parliament, 1529, 1536, the opposition destroyed, and it was. The dissolution of the monasteries. The faith of the church under Henry VIII. I'll stop counting it on my hand because I'm not good at it. <laughs> Edward VI, the Protestant Revolution. Edward VI, the revolution accomplished. Mary Tudor, the Catholic Restoration. The Elizabethan Settlement of Religion. The Elizabethan Church, Catholics and Protestants. Defenders of the Faith, the Elizabethan Martyrs. And finally, the concluding chapter, what happened at the Reformation. So it's a concise book. You can read it in an afternoon. And I strongly encourage anyone that wants to know re what, what really happened at the English Reformation to read it. Now, you may be wondering, well, uh, why is that important? Well, because you speak some form of English. That's why you wouldn't be here today and you wouldn't know Protestants, the Clintons, Methodists. You wouldn't know Lutherans. You wouldn't know Anglicans. You wouldn't know hardly any of these sects or the other 37,000 of Bresler's 30, uh, 37,000 ice cream uh, varieties of denominations had it not been for the English-speaking Reformation. Yes, it is true that Luther is to, uh, is to, and we'll get into Luther a little bit, is also to blame. But if it doesn't, if the cancer, and Sister talked about this yesterday, if you have healthy cells, if the cells had been healthy in the English-speaking world, which only existed in England at the time, and if they had repulsed and repelled the Lutheran Protestants, we wouldn't be having the conversations we're having today. We have a totally different world. And, and, and Charles concluded his talk with, with, with what a, a different world it would be if certain things happened. Last night I had the pleasure of speaking with Mr. Gary Potter, and um, Mr. Potter told me the same thing. He likes to talk about what ifs. I think someone could make novels out of these what ifs. But just think about this. If the Protestant if the English Reformation doesn't happen, much of what we know today is not what we know today. So we, we may not even be here. Who knows? What's the history of the Reformation in England? It's very long. It's complicated. I'm going to quote from Father uh, Culkin in, in, in the first chapter of the book. 
It's just it's extraordinarily interesting. The history of the Reformation in England is long and complicated. The stages by which Catholic England became officially a Protestant country occupy a full 30 years. That's not even a generation, 30 years, from 1529 to 1559. The story begins in the year 1529 when Henry VIII, anxious to be rid of his wife, Catherine of Aragon, so that he might marry Anne Boleyn, realized that Pope Clement VII would not be bullied into pronouncing his marriage invalid. In the following years, Henry, who was determined to have his own way, and boy howdy was he, abolished the power of the Pope in England and declared himself to be head of the church. Under the rule of Henry's son and successor, Edward VI, a child of nine years old, when he became king in 19, 1547, the religious revolution was carried a stage further. The government of the day, a band of unscrupulous adventurers who ruled in the name of the boy king, completely transformed the church's belief and worship. Now, there's just another, another couple of notes about Henry that you have to know. He was given a title by the pope as defender of the faith. I mean, he was as devout a Catholic. It, it is part of the, the biographies of Henry VIII. And um, I believe I, I uh, uh, heard mention today that the chapel at Walsingham is being rebuilt. Walsingham. Walsingham. Henry made the pilgrimage barefoot. Made it several times. He, by all accounts, was a, was a wonderful Catholic and a wonderful Catholic king. Back to Father Culkin. In, in less than six years, from 1570, uh, 1547 to 1553, the mass was abolished. The altars were destroyed. Wait a minute, wait a minute. I've heard this before. Did I say 57, 1557 or was that 1967? The mass was abolished. The altars destroyed. The sacraments reduced from seven to two. And a new liturgy, a new profession of faith, and a new form of worship were imposed on the country. While the church itself was robbed and pillaged to the pockets by these so-called reformers. Henry had fought the Pope and persecuted both Catholics and Protestants. Now, Henry did not distinguish. Either you were under Henry's rule or you weren't. And if you weren't, you were dead. Pretty simple. He would find you and they would execute you. Under his son, foreign Protestants swarmed into the country. That was by design, by the way. They were given the chief teaching post in the universities. And it was by their advice that the religious revolution was accomplished. All this was done by a party. The English people and the English church were never consulted. Those who opposed this reform ended up on the tower or on the scaffold. I'll tell you about the scaffold in a, in a few moments. Now, I don't have time to go into all the details, but I'd like to continue from the book to dispel some urban legends about the English Deformation. For the sake of example, let's talk about the liturgy of the Anglican Mass. That, now, here's the urban legend that it was brought about by what we would call a synod or a council, and that these bishops that were there were officially consecrated for the, for the task, and that they went into the room and they went into the council to actually produce liturgy. Now, anyone that knows the, um, the, the great English, um, I guess he was a school teacher and Catholic lecturer, Michael Davies, will know if you've heard any of his talks about the development of the Latin Mass in liturgy, you know that liturgy does not come out of a, uh, of a liturgy does not come out of a Knights of Columbus meeting. You don't go into a room and create a liturgy. It happens over time. It's a tradition that takes years and years, if not centuries, maybe even a millennia to put together. They did it in the span of a couple of months. Listen, as Father Culkin informs us, the Protestant leaders of the nation drew up official statement of the new official religion. The 42 articles, they even numbered it, the 42 articles of religion which were, oh, the 42 articles of religion, which were approved by Edward, I remember Edward's nine years old, got a nine-year-old approving new liturgies. What could possibly go right? <laughs> well, it gets even worse. The boy king is suffering from, we don't know what disease, he might have had cholera, nobody knows what he had, but he could barely lift his hand. He had to have his hand lifted. Basically, you, 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 you just signed the document, your majesty. Nine years old. The title page of the article states that they were, quote, approved by the Senate of London. This is not true, writes Father uh, Colkin. They were simply imposed by the government, as indeed was the whole of the Reformation settlement of religion. With this last act, we can say that all the measures by which the Catholic faith of England was officially and legally abolished were completed. 
It's quite a, a story, isn't it? It gets even better, though. I, 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 I'd like to delve into history and like to try to prove things to see what the historical record actually says. Here's what the historical record actually says about this synod. A quote now from the work of Master of, of Arts Charles Hardwick in 1876. This is what actually happened. Quote, A third and far, and far more cogent reason for disputing the synodical approbation of the articles is furnished. Now, I'll just stop right here because some of you may wonder, Middle Church, Middle Church, why does it matter how they got their liturgy? Well, because they told the people of England that it came from on high, that they went into a holy synod and they had prayers and the Holy Ghost came down and that, the, that this was inspired work. That's why it matters. So the people of England are going to reject it anyways, but they ultimately will succumb under threat of death. And that's where we get into the stories of the great Douay Rames or the Douay, uh, Douay martyrs that were, I hate to say this, they were Jesuits. I don't hate to say it, I'm kidding. Here's what, here's, what, here's what Professor Hardwick found in his research. This was published in 1876. The reason why I like to go back into the 19th and 17th century for works like this is because they actually had to go to libraries and look it up and write it down. If they're going to quote something, they couldn't Google it. They had to actually go find it. A third and far more cogent reason for disputing the synodical approbation of the articles is furnished by the language of Thomas Cran Cranmer and Philpot. When questioned on this very subject at the opening of the reign of Mary, it has already been noticed that when the articles were completed in the spring of 1553, they were made public in a separate form and also in the company of a certain catechism. Now, in reference to this second work, complaints were made by Weston, the prolocutor uh, of the Southern Convocation, which assembled in the following autumn to the effect that, quote, it bore the name of the Honorable Synod, although, as he understood, put forth without their consent. Philpot, who was at present as Archdeacon of Winchester, explained at some length in what way it might well be said to be done in the Synod of London, close quote. Although the members of the present house had no notice thereof before the promulgation. He seems to have imagined that when the clergy authorized certain persons to make ecclesiastical laws, they had transferred their own synodic rights to this committee. Now this, I'll explain this in just a moment. But Cranmer, in his disputation at Oxford in April of 1554, appears to have supplied a somewhat different, if not contradictory, solution. When charged by Weston with publishing a catechism in the name of the Synod of London, he answered, I was ignorant of the setting to, of that title. And as soon as I had knowledge thereof, I did not like it. Therefore, when I complained thereof to the council, it was answered me by them, that the book was so entitled because it was set forth in the time of the convocation. Close quote. And then back to Hardwick. But these testimonies sanctioned the hypothesis that the catechism in question had never been regularly submitted to a synod of the southern province, much less approved and authorized by the two houses. And therefore, if the articles are necessarily implicated in the disclaimers here reduced, we are compelled to acquiesce in the idea that they had also been, been put in circulation by the royal council with no formal approbation of the church at large. Close quote. In other words, they made it up. It didn't happen. You can't get a liturgy unless you have a tradition. You can't have a tradition unless you have years. They didn't have either, so they went into a fake council, had a fake meeting, took fake notes, and then wrote a fake, uh, a fake liturgy, and then presented it as an authentically, synodically approved document, and it wasn't. And that's how this begins. Now, we all know what happened at Vatican II. At least they have documents. At least we know who they were. And at least we know that they actually met, right? At least we know that they actually, that they did promulgate things. At least we know that they, that they had a constitution that they came out with. In other words, we know what happened. We all know about the Council of Trent and then the other councils. We all know what happened there. How? They wrote it down. Why did they write it down? So you'd have confidence in it. So you wouldn't be wondering what happened, not dreaming about it or fantasizing about it. You'd actually know. The English did not do this. These men that perpetrated this act did not do this. And that's why this is important. The, and, and the point that, that I'd like to uh, make about this is that 
The people of England today don't know any of this. It's not in their history. And they think that this was all... Here, I'll give you the urban legend version. The urban legend version of the nasty, mean-spirited, crooked, and corrupt evil Catholics spurred on by their equally evil and corrupt Catholic Pope had so worn out their welcome in England that thanks to the heroism of, Henry, of the adulterer Henry VIII riding up on his adultering stallion, as he was a stallion, saving the day and saving all of England from the horrors of Catholicism. That's the urban legend. It's not, and it is just that, it's an urban legend. It didn't happen. Now, I may be preaching to the choir, but we are hopefully getting this message out to people that haven't heard it before. I'd like to uh, take the opportunity to destroy another urban legend while we're on the subject of the great faith robbery. Let's deal with the claim that Mary Tudor was known as Bloody Mary. Now, what's, what's this urban legend? She was a, a demonically inspired, evil, hated martyr of Protestants. Is it true? Well, there were Protestant martyrs, but they were Protestant martyrs thanks to the laws that had been imposed by previous kings, including Henry VIII, Henry VII, and going all the way back to the 13th century. All Mary said was, bring back the heresy laws. What happens when we don't have heresy laws? We have Methodists that are marrying sodomites. That's what happens. <laughs> Linda Porter, Mr. Potter quoted her yesterday. Linda Porter has a book out called The Myth of Bloody Mary. I bought it. It's a good read. Read it if you're interested in the subject. Brief excerpt. Quote, the responsibility for the continuance of such a policy, they're talking about the, the executions under, uh, under allegedly Bloody Mary, burning at the stake, for example, for heresy, has been widely debated. John Fox, writing in Elizabeth's time, tended to exonerate Mary herself. He laid the blame for the inception of the idea with this guy named Gardiner and believed that its continuance after Gardiner's death was the work of Pole and Bishop Edmund Bonner of London. In, the, in, in, in this reading of events, the queen is sincere but ill-advised. Terrible things are being done in her name, but, but yet she is not directly involved. Yet though the business of government placed many demands on Mary's time and attention, the fact remains that she could have stopped the burnings with a simple order to desist. She did not do so because of the nature of the crime. Mary could never condone heresy. It was an affront to her conscience, and that conscience had guided her actions since she was 17 years old. For her, extending any kind of mercy to these deluded sinner, sinners was unthinkable. Now, we know that that's a crime against, that's a sin against what? Charity. If you know somebody's a heretic, tell them to stop. <laughs> if, if, if you don't, then you're condoning it. Many, uh, continuing with Miss Porter, many of them wanted her dead or at least dethroned. The queen understood well the power of the written and spoken word, but not even greater uh, the greater propaganda victory that came with martyrdom. There could be no middle course, no bargaining with such errors. She would have seen this as negotiating with the devil. In the mid-16th century Europe, the idea of respecting another person's belief would have provoked incredulity. Such certainties bred oppressors and those who were willing to be sacrificed. Mary herself had said she would die for her faith during Edward VI's reign. There is no reason to doubt her. In other words, the heresy laws are on the books for a long time in almost all of England, and Mary just upheld them. That's all she basically did. Now, who was it that propagated this urban legend? It was none other than the Protestant John Fox, who wrote Fox's history of the, of the of Protestants and, and, and martyrs in England. Did Fox get it right? Well... Turn to another source, Jean-Marie Stone, saying this, No more potent means could have been devised for saturating the, nat the national mind with the principles of the Reformation than the diffusion of the Book of Martyrs on this gigantic scale. In a few years, there was scarcely a parish in England that did not possess a chained copy of the work. The illiterate might frequently be seen standing in a group round the lectern while one, while one among them, better instructed than the rest, read to them aloud its graphic and lying legends. There's much more on this, and you can read it if you get the book, The English Reformation by Father Culkin, that I have republished. Uh, if, I'd like to show you what, what happened, though, after Bloody Bess, Henry's daughter, after the Reformation was complete and after Catholicism was outlawed in England. 
new and more better ways of executing Catholics were invented. Yeah, if you would pass these, um, you could take a look at these. I'm going to describe to you what is written there in Latin. That is an illustration of the execution of St. Edmund Campion. Later on today, brother's going to talk about St. Robert Southwell. And his execution was similar, I think. Um, here is the description that is on that, that engraving there, which uh, Sister Philomena graciously informed me was, writ, uh, was um, etched, engraved by William Cardinal Allen in uh, Macreta, Italy. I'm not saying that right. Here's what that graphic says. The following is the description of Edmund Campion's gruesome execution. A, if you're looking at it, A. Edmund Campion of the Society of Jesus preaches under the gibbet and immediately thereafter is hung with his companions, Father Alexander Bryant, S.J., and Father Ralph Sherwin. B. After they are laid down, their heart and entrails are extracted and cast into, and they're cast into the, uh, the water. C. Now, their heart and entrails are extracted while they're alive. They are not dead. They only hang them to, to subdue them and to take most of the life out of them. Then they let them down, and then they take the hearts and the entrails out. C. Their members are boiled in boiling water, then hung on the towers and gates of the city in the reign of Queen Elizabeth in the year 1581 on the first day of December. Several thousands of these men were steadfast in death for having converted to the Roman church. So there never was the equivalent of what we would call council or any of that stuff and any that, that, that made this new liturgy, and anyone that disagreed with it, and if you were Catholic, were then targeted for execution. I'm sure that my brother's going to uh, t t uh, talk to you about the, uh, uh, the life and some of the poetry and then the martyrdom of Robert Southwell. You all know many of the other martyrs. St. John Fisher was martyred under Henry VIII. I've got two copies of this book that was written by E.E. E. Reynolds. It's been translated from the Latin into English. If you'd like a copy, it's a great history of the life of St. John Fisher. He had to be one of the most humble men in England at the time. When he died, there's, there, there's an account given in uh, one of the early chapters in the book. When, uh, when St. John Fisher died, they did a catalog. It was one of the things that Henry accused him of was being opulent. Well, they did a catalog of what he had in his, in his cell. Everything was a hand-me-down, some of it fourth generation. He had nothing. He didn't have a bed. He slept on basically on a, on, a, on a mattress made out of sticks. Let's get to Father Luther. It's one of my favorite talks, uh, part of the uh, talk here. Friar Luther. Let's return to a little conversation about him. I'd like to quote a history of the church to the eve of the Re Reformation by Monsignor Philip Hughes, who was a Roman Catholic priest and ecclesial, ecclesiastical historian who taught postgraduate courses at the University of Notre Dame. And he wrote this in 1903, when Notre Dame was still a Catholic university. Hughes summarizes the great faith robbery visited upon the entire of Europe, then the planet, by Father Luther. Quote, For the many terrible evils from which Christian life was suffering, Luther brought not one single remedy. He could do no more than exhort and denounce and destroy. There was the problem of clerical worldliness. Luther, heir to the long line of fake mis mystiques for whom clerical ownership was sinful, abolished the cleric altogether. There was the problem of the scandal caused by rival philosophies and the effect of the rivalry on theology and mysticism. What was Luther's answer? Luther again, the term of a long development, drove out all philosophy and theology with it. The very purpose of the intelligence is knowledge. To ensure or to inquire is its essential act. But in the sphere of all but the practical and concrete and the individual, Luther bade the Christian stifle its promptings as a temptation and a snare. Once again, Luther was not a pioneer in the solution that he offers. There is the problem with the church herself, how it could best be kept unspotted despite its contacts with the world. What was Luther's solution? Abolish the church. <laughs> In concluding the great faith robbery that was perpetrated by the House of Tudor on the people of, uh, 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 on the people of England and persists to this day, 
I'll return back to the work of Father Culkin. Again, the book is called The Great, I'm, I'm sorry, The English Reformation. It's available at my website at mikechurch.com if you're interested in it, or just send me an email and I'll, I'll send you the link. We have it in hardback and in a digital ebook. And the benefit of getting it in an ebook is that it has all the hyperlinks to all the research that um, I added to Father, uh, Father Culkin's work, which he could not possibly have done in the 1950s. Here's how Father concludes the English Reformation. Quote, The true story of what happened in England at the Re at Reformation was for long obscured by the official propaganda put out to conceal the violence and trickery by which that revolution was accomplished. And for generations, people in England could learn of these events only from the official history, which was based on that propaganda. That day is now past. Today, the record is plain for all to read in the work of scholars whose sole interest is to find out what actually happened in history. There would indeed be no sufficient reason for recalling the story of these tragic days if no other end were served than to rekindle ancient animosities and religious passions. But if that story be a necessary basis for understanding the truth, then to tell that story is a duty which cannot be shirked. There are many people in England today to whom the claims of the Catholic Church seem absurd or exaggerated, yet no one can fairly claim to have examined that church's claims who has not attempted to understand what it was that happened in England during the English Reformation. Thank you very much. God bless you. say that it was a very, very enjoyable talk. Of course, it's a, a uh, subject dear to my heart. I will say, though, that, uh, you know, England does still, as we know, have a great deal of influence on us culturally, especially if you watch PBS. And <laughs> some few years ago, I was at a dinner in London. It was white tie. And, you know, white tie and tails and all that. And afterwards, a group of maybe nine or ten of us went out to a place in Earl's Court. We sat around, we were drinking and all that. And I was about to go get another drink, and suddenly this guy grabs my arm, and he says, uh, excuse me, are you English or American? And I said, I'm American. He said, oh, that's great. Where in the States are you from? California. So are we. I said, great. You know, they, they were, I mean, they were dressed like bums. And so are we. I said, that's great. He said, so what part? L.A. We're from the Valley. I said, that's just great. You know, we were wondering, were you guys in a show or something? And I said, uh, no. Well, why are you dressed like that? I said, well, in this country, sometimes people dress this way for different things. And the guy goes, wow, that is so PBS. <laughs> When they left, my friend said to me, uh, Charles, what did they mean that was so PBS? I couldn't get it out. I just, I, I, I couldn't do it. I said, it's an American thing. You wouldn't understand. I, I no. Anyway, uh, however, we are not going to be dressing for lunch. the uh, 